people. Um, it is Michael's pleasure today, where's Howard, <laughs> as well as mine, to introduce Howard Eisenberg. Howard has been a fellow of senior college for some time now. However, living as he does well out of the city, he usually joins us on Zoom. So I only know you from here up, I realize, you know, uh, but it is an advantage of our current hybrid option. Howard is a physician, a graduate of McGill Medical School, and he continues to have an active practice in psychotherapy with a focus on stress and anxiety management, utilizing techniques of mindfulness-based care and cognitive meditation. He's also a life coach, not only for individuals, but also working with corporations as an executive life coach through the company he founded called Sintrek. He's also the founder of the Center for Mind Enhancement. Now, before medical school, Howard did undergraduate work in psychology, which he continued into graduate school at McGill. His master's thesis involved research on telepathy, and he has had a long-standing interest in parapsychology. He introduced, in fact, parapsychology courses as a lecturer at the U of T, and he co-founded an interdisciplinary study group on complementary and alternative medicine as an associate professor at the University of Vermont. Now, in 1977, Howard published a book entitled Inner Spaces, Parapsychological Explorations of the Mind. Over the last several years, he's continued to follow his fascination with the nature of reality, how reality works, and the primacy of consciousness, which has culminated in a new book, a reworking and expansion of his earlier work called Dream It to Do It, published in 2021. So without further ado, here's Howard Eisenberg. Thank you, Linda, on behalf of Michael, <laughs> and and also uh, in and also in in your role uh, with Daphne as co-chair uh, of uh, the program committee, and I appreciate this opportunity to share what I think I've discovered at a very perilous time that we're living through right now, that I hope uh, will be extremely beneficial to you. It will also be a very mind-blowing lecture. Uh, Iona uh, is one of the most information dense publications out there, and we're going to pack a lot into this hour, but we do have a following one hour of Q&A, so hopefully that will uh, suffice. I will be drawing on all types of information, both historical and cross-disciplinary, and I'm going to go start a few thousand years ago with Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, and I, I took a course in philosophy as a minor when I was at McGill as an undergraduate, and it was a pleasant surprise to discover Plato, the Republic, and particularly the allegory of the cave, which has stayed with me all these years, and, and that's a lot of years. I'm, a, I'm 77 now. Um, what struck me about it was how poignant it was, and I didn't even appreciate, even though I've retained it as a memory all these years, I didn't appreciate how serious this really was for the types of difficulties that we face in contemporary society. Just want to uh, adjust my timer here. In Plato's Republic, in the allegory of the cave, as some of you may know, there's a group of prisoners who are chained to a wall in the cave. All they can see occasionally are flickering shadows. That's their whole sense of reality. And they've been chained like that for most of their lives. One day, one of the prisoners somehow escapes. He makes it to the exit, the entrance to the cave, steps outside, and immediately is blinded by the sunlight. And in great distress and agony, but gradually, his eyes accommodate to the greater brightness that he's never experienced before all these years. And he starts to see. He sees forms, he sees colors, he sees beauty. He decides to try to go back to the cave to share what he's discovered with the other prisoners. But when he re-enters the cave, he's temporarily blinded again, this time by the lack of light. And it takes time again for the eyes to accommodate. During this period, the other prisoners sense his distress. And although he tries to convince them there's a greater world out there, 
to join him. They're too afraid. So they remain. But the point is, they don't remain prisoners because of material restraints. They remain prisoners because of emotional fear restraints. And I think that has great relevance for what we're dealing with right now. What if right now in our lives, in our educated and cultured part of the world, what if we have a totally wrong sense of how reality works and our place in it? And I want to suggest to you that is the reality. Another ancient source I want to draw on is Machu Chengsu, 4th century BC Chinese Taoist philosopher and the famous butterfly dream. Once upon a time, I dreamt I was flying as a butterfly. However, soon I awakened and was my familiar self again. Now, I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I'm a man. The interesting thing about this dream I found is that again, it raises the notion of, can we in our, whatever state of consciousness we might be in, can we know what is true? Can we know what is real? Over the years, I've given a challenge to many of my students, uh, seminar attendees and colleagues professionally in the thousands at this point. And I've asked if any of them could come up with a definitive proof that they were not at that moment in a dream. And no one has been able to come up with that. A definitive, absolute proof that they're not in a dream state at that time. Because as you know, sometimes when you're in a dream, until you wake up, it feels totally real to you. But think of the implications of this. If, if we can't absolutely know the difference between when we're in a dream state and what we call the waking reality state, then that's a pretty flimsy sense of reality. As I said, these are difficult times. And that's why it's so important for us to have an awareness that perhaps we're missing an understanding, a profound understanding of how the real world works. And again, as I say, our place in it. I think all of you can't help but relate to these types of questions. Do you wonder sometimes how and why you're here? What here even is and who you are? in the greater scheme of things? Are you not feeling increasing overwhelm and despair about the world around you because it's taken such a dark turn? These questions are deep and they've been preoccupying me since I was a child again, and that's been, as I say, in this now for 77 years. But in the last few years, I suddenly realized that our whole sense of civilization, of culture, was threatened and much more fragile than, than we had thought. Back in 2018, I was invited to present a keynote presentation for the annual conference of a group of professionals. And to honor it, I did a very, very deep dive, as you will be seeing, into the scientific literature, the philosophical literature, the religious literature, the indigenous literature of what we have of it, the latest discoveries in modern psychology and neuroscience, neuroplasticity, the MRI scans, different brain functions, the renaissance of psychedelics, new research that's coming out and people feeling a little more open to share what for many years they've suppressed. Drawing on all of those sources, and I'm gonna to try to somewhat summarize some of the key insights that I had at that time. My chapter one is entitled Things are not as they seem. And you're gonna get a very deep immersion of that in just a few minutes. My second chapter is the only thing you can absolutely know, chapter two, and we'll touch on that one as well. But back to chapter one. Our sense of how life works is all from our conditioning from our previous experiences. However, the beliefs we develop can become like filters and blinding us until others might see things and value things so differently. So careful not to let yourself, even as we talk about some pretty powerful things this morning, not to be blinded by old beliefs and also fear, like the prisoners in Plato's cave. As in the Bible, 
maybe you have to be as a child again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Or as the, the Zen scholar Suzuki teaches, Zen mind, beginner's mind. You have to remove the filters if you're really going to learn, especially if it's something radically different than what you previously believed in. I'm going to begin by starting this deep dive by actually deconstructing your sense of reality. All of this is science with some logic. First of all, the reality we experience right now in common, we call consensual reality. This is after Dr. Charles Tart. We thought until recently that we were emerging into a golden age of progress where we had almost godlike technologies. We knew it all, we had mastery of all, and there was just a few little things we still needed before we had utopia. But as we know, things these last several years are not going that way. If anything, we're aiming for a dystopian future and we have increasing entropic decline of everything that has been ordered in what we understood as our civilization. When we look at society, there's breakdown in every way you can imagine. Depression is now one of the leading causes of morbidity in the world. Loneliness has become an epidemic. The Surgeon General of the United States felt impelled to write a book about it. The UK and Japan have appointed federal ministers of loneliness. It's considered a crisis. We also have tremendous divisiveness now, unparalleled in most of our time. We have an unleashing of anger, called, we call it amygdala hijack, hijacked by the amygdala, the primitive brain function. We have failing democracies and the drums of war are beating louder. All this you know to be true. It's not controversial, but it's sad and scary. On the ecological side, there's nowhere in the world now, physically as we understand it, where you're free of toxic pollutants. Global climate change has bitten us this last year all over the world in various ways, and it's just a sampler of what's coming. And we have multiple species extinctions, which upsets the whole web of life. If that wasn't enough, we also have literally existential threats to our existence. And I mean, by I say our existence, I mean humanity's existence, humankind. The doomsday clock is maintained by the bulletin of atomic scientists. Two years ago, when I did my book, which was the fall of uh, 2021, was released, the doomsday clock was set as the unprecedented short interval of just 100 seconds before midnight. But that was before the Russian war in Europe. That was before runaway inflation. That was before these unprecedented climate disasters and ominously, and yet to be understood by people. And that was before the release of ChatGPT, rogue artificial intelligence. So again, 100 seconds before midnight and before all of these rather unpleasant, undesirable things. I hesitate to guess where it is now. I know they moved it to 90 seconds, but I think if they did up uh, to date, we're pretty close to what's considered global catastrophe, the end. Continuing to deconstruct our sense of what is real, what is solid, what is predictable. Let's look at the brain and consciousness. Again, some of this will be radical to some of you, but it's all very well documented in my book and other sources. There is no proof whatsoever that the physical head brain produces our experience of consciousness, our experience of being aware of awareness, our sense of mind. None. Zero. There's not even a generally accepted theory of how the brain can produce our experience of consciousness of mind. The philosopher David Chalmers appropriately called this the hard problem. And he didn't mean just for philosophy, he meant for science, because we just don't know how to get our handles along further. I like the way the New Age author, Peter Russell, it's a different Peter Russell than here at the college. I like the way he flips the argument from being on the defensive to overwhelm the, the, the skeptics who say such things, you know, are, are obvious. Of course, the brain produces consciousness. And he says, how can something as immaterial as consciousness arise from something as unconscious as matter? It's a good way of putting it. Western science is also mistaken, if we go back to consensual reality, about the role of the head brain 
because we as humans actually all have at least three brains. We also have a heart brain and we have a microbiome, a gut brain. I won't talk too much about this, there's so much more to go into, but on the heart brain, just for a few moments. So the heart has neurons, it has nerve cells. The heart has its own memory system. The heart has more nerves upregulating brain function than the brain can modulate heart function. The heart also can secrete the love hormone, oxytocin, which connects us. And there's some research in the Institute of Heart Math that seems to suggest that the heart is also a portal for our intuitive awareness. And then there's the gut, the microbiome, which is filled with trillions of bacteria, collectively having more DNA than we have in our own so-called human body. But beyond that, what's really interesting is that in psychiatry and modern medicine, there's been much discussion and all types of pharmaceutical interventions to modify head serotonin levels in the head brain. And yet 90% of serotonin is synthesized, is secreted in the gut by the bacteria in your large bowel and your colon, not from the head brain. So again, we have that all wrong. I will submit to you, the head brain does have a role in what we experience as consciousness, but not as the source of it, not as the generator of it. It's a receiver. It's a selective receiver. And there's much evidence we can go into perhaps in the Q&A or in my book uh, as to how we know it functions as a receiver. But it's actually more than just a receiver. It's almost more like a transducer because it can receive downloads from our level of consciousness, which we'll get into today. But it can also send uploads, which is known properly as manifestation. And we'll clarify some of the misconceptions as we get into that a little later on. Okay. So we've dealt with societal collapse. We, we've dealt with proving again that our whole assumption in Western psychology, neurology, science broadly, and the general populations of the advanced countries, that it is wrong that the brain absolutely produces our experience of consciousness, even though we all assume, of course it's real. It's just an assumption and there's no proof of it. Now let's take on physics. Interesting, this title, you could see it. You know, what is reality? And then smaller print. The more we look at it, the less real it seems. A physics compared to, for example, psychology is often considered one of the harder sciences. It's more definitive. It's more tangible. It's more relevant and applicable. Psychology being soft, more speculative. However, when we take a deep dive into what's really happening in the world of physics, we find it's totally contrary again to our understanding of reality. Some of you already know that everything solid, like this podium, is actually mostly not solid. In fact, it's about 99.99999% empty space. There's no solidity. We see solidity, we feel solidity, but it's an illusion. And we know that from what physics is telling us. It gets worse. But we used to also think that, well, everything is comprised of fundamental building block particles, smaller and smaller, more and more exotic. But ultimately, that was our understanding that the ultimate construction of the universe is material, physical. It just gets more and more microscopic. But it's not working out that way. What we find is when you really try to go down to the small particles, they don't have a specific existence and location. It's more like a zone of probability. And to be able to bring it into our perception, our instrumentation as something tangible, it requires the act of human observation. And that's why Wheeler said, we live in a participatory universe because it takes human observation to cause a collapse of the probability wave for matter to manifest. That's from physics. This is not metaphysics. This is physics. In fact, I have a quote from the founder of quantum mechanics, Max Planck. I regard consciousness as fundamental. Matter is derivative of consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. There is no matter as such. Again, that's physics. Now, let's take a small dive into what historically has been one of my passions, parapsychology, which I taught here as a, a course at the University of Toronto about a half century ago. Parapsychology looks at, if you like, mind over matter phenomena. 
things like telepathy, which was my research thesis at McGill, uh, clairvoyance, which is awareness of things in some distance, also in modern terminology referred to as remote viewing, precognition, an awareness of the future before we understand it is even materialized and happened. Parapsychology has been considered the weakest of all the sciences, the most questionable of those sciences, and some would call it a pseudoscience. However, that's because it doesn't correlate with our model of reality. So we're taught it's impossible. How can things which don't have measurable forces, which cannot be blocked by any types of shielding, how can such things be possible? Well, as I said again, our model of reality is flawed. It's, it's quite wrong. Let me give you some highlights of some of the research that you don't know about, most likely. And it's very, very powerful. While parapsychology and psychic phenomena were being dismissed by scientists and skeptics as, as just being against pseudoscience, uh, occultism, whatever, on the other hand, the American intelligence and military community took it extremely seriously and for approximately 25 years funded Stargate through Stanford Research Institute initially. Very high level prestigious research on what they call remote viewing. They taught people to be able to travel to another location in their mind, if you like, in their imagination, to do reconnaissance, to be able to see things as a spy, so to speak, that they couldn't access because of distance and physical barriers and security and so on. And it was extremely successful. It went on for almost 25 years both intelligence funding it separately and military funding it separately. And then there's the ongoing research called the Global Consciousness Project. That tracks the impact of the simultaneous focus attention of millions of people worldwide during major events on random physical measurement devices located in up to 70 host sites in the world at any one time. Their research has been going on now for more than two decades. They have found that large scale group consciousness can affect the physical world. It's yielded results statistically at the six, excuse me, at the seven sigma level of odds against chance, which is more than one trillion to one. It's not a soft science, it's a hard science. It studies reality. Now let's take a look at the actual process of discovery in science generally. And I'm talking when I say that historically in our conventional sciences. We've been taught a scientific method. We've been given the impression that many of the breakthroughs in science came after laborious, almost algorithmic-like research from A to Z. We've been missold on that too. That's not how scientists and inventors come up with their discoveries and their devices. Let's even take, for example, Einstein. We know Einstein is a genius. Many of us think of him as a mathematical genius in physics and understanding how various things relate and being able to predict various things that we have found testing subsequently has been quite accurate. But Einstein began his research and understanding cosmology, how the universe works, at the tender age of 16. And the way he began it was with a thought experiment. He imagined riding a beam of light through the universe and how he'd experience everything differently. That's what gave rise eventually to the theory of relativity in EMC squared. It was envisioning using his imagination, not through his mathematical formulations. Nikolai Tesla is one of the most famous inventors of the modern technological era. His research, his discoveries, his inventions are the basis of most of our infrastructure of our electrical system in ways you can't even imagine, including even the smartphone. He was also very interested in the old Vedic texts of ancient India, and he was tutored by one of the Vedic teachers. The way Tesla produced his works of invention was by first imagining them in his mind visually. He could do more than that. He also would turn them on and run it like a simulation and see like, does it work? When I like flip the switch, does it turn on? And does something have to be adjusted, fine-tuned? That's how he did it, with his mind, with his imagination, not in a physical laboratory. So again, our, our understanding of how scientific invention comes about is totally again wrong. It comes from within. In fact, 
I would suggest to you that imagination is the source of everything we've ever discovered and invented, everything. It seems ridiculous if I haven't shared what I have, and we'll go further, obviously, uh, to say thoughts become things, because we think that's very different. There's thoughts, immaterial, and there's things, material. But they do become things, and you know it through things like the placebo effect. If somebody believes that a chemically inert substance that looks like a real pill or capsule is a real chemical drug that's going to have a certain effect on them, be it to relieve pain, be it to relieve whatever, heartburn, uh, or even, believe it or not, sometimes it's an antibiotic for infection. If they believe it enough, it has that effect most of the time. The same is, is true the opposite. If they believe that it's a drug and drugs have side effects and they have bad experiences previously with side effects or no people have, they're probably going to have a bad side effect just from their imagination. And I don't mean just emotionally, I mean physically, physiologically. So thoughts become things. Then we have epigenetics. We were taught that we inherit certain genes from our parents and the ancestry before that. And that kind of fixes our composition in many respects. We now know that there's something called epigenetics. It is possible to modify the way the genes work. We call the gene expression. And then another example of that, stretching it further and coming back to brain and consciousness and mind is neuroplasticity. We now know that if people change their thought patterns, their behavioral patterns, it can change the wiring of the brain, the connections, the process things in a totally different way. So it's not again brain causing consciousness of which there's no proof for theory, but we do know consciousness can change physical brain. Another form of proof again, brain is not the source. It's something out there, but it's not the source. So as we go deeper, what's real? Remember, prisoners of Plato's cave, being in the end enchained by fear, not by material restraint. Remember the butterfly dream, where people can't even know for sure if they're dreaming or not. And then remember the science. It's not what we thought it was in terms of brain, in terms of external material matter, even in terms of things like psychic phenomena. There's something else we've been missing hugely. The notion that we've had up to now, we call it the materialistic reductionist paradigm. It was a belief that everything ultimately is physical, even down to the minute particles I said earlier, and also that we're all separate. So we're separate from each other physically, we're separate from other sentient beings, we're separate from nature. The new research is suggesting the exact opposite that the separation is illusion or wrong belief, misbelief, that ultimately everything seems connected. We're gonna get deeper into this. So again, what physics is telling us is that physical reality is mere waves of probability imagined and observed into form. I'll repeat that. So physics is teaching us now, the latest discoveries of physics, that our physical reality is merely waves of probability Imagine and observed into form. Our consensual world is more like a virtual reality. It's a dreamlike state that we've unknowingly created. Our notion of each other's separate selves is an illusion, just like when we have dreams in our own dreams. We can have other people populating in dreams, but we're sort of the only real one. But it seems in the dream that we're very much interacting with other people, other characters. We're existing, as Wheeler pointed out, in a participatory universe. We are the created and the creator. And the underlying field of consciousness exists and manifests through our own experiences in everyday lives. We are a way for the universe to experience itself. In the words of Kendall Chandan, we are not human beings having spiritual experiences. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. I think of us also being amphibious beings, like amphibians, Frogs, salamanders can live on more than one element, water or land. And in our case, we can exist on this level, which I said is our consensual reality, where we experience ourselves as separate individuals and a solid physicality, which again, as I said, is an illusion, but that's how we experience it.
but we can also go to another level of consciousness, which we're going to be getting into, where we experience the connectivity of all and the resourcefulness to infinite information and power. I know this is provocative, to say the least, and I forewarned you it would be mind-blowing. Besides the science, we can also work with some logic. The knower cannot know itself. Therefore, your ego, of which you're aware as your personality feelings, cannot be who you really are. As Shankara, the Vedic sage, said, the knower is not the known. We can also do it experientially. So this one you have to imagine, part of you could do it at home as well, but if you do do it at home physically, just do it for a couple of minutes. It's powerful. And that's looking at your face in the mirror. So you'd have to imagine what we're talking about right now. So when you look at your face in the mirror, you hopefully recognize your face. You may not like the way it looks some mornings and you know over the years and so on, but you recognize the face. But if you keep looking at your face for a couple of minutes and reflect, you realize what you're looking at is not you. It's your face, yes. You recognize it as a face up there, but it's not you. You is looking at the face. So again, we, we get confused. Where's it coming from? And the two key things we have to come back on Plato's cave are the delusional belief that we're separate from each other and everything else, and the problem we have with being so distracted. One of my colleagues said that much of social media, much of the internet resources are free, but there is a cost, and the cost is your attention. And it's a very serious cost, the symbolism that we're seeing. Okay, so now let's dive deeper into, okay, so what is reality? We talked about what's not, what is reality? There is a world behind this world, behind this concentral level, another level, another dimension, if you like. And let's start with the map. How do we know about it? So it's not just by elimination of what we thought was real, and as I pointed out, is not real, correct? It has, there's other sources. We have the revelatory experiences from people having spontaneous clinical experiences. We have the experiences of people with psychedelic plant medicines. We have the experiences of people's science of meditation, where they experience unusual things beyond just relaxation. We have the indigenous wisdom teachings passed on traditionally from thousands of years ago in different areas of the globe but very, very similar in what they are describing as reality. And then we have also the perennial philosophy. As you know, there are so many different religions, which is one of the reasons why religion has declined relative to science, because it seemed that there's so many different versions of the truth from religion. How can you believe any of them? And therefore, science seemed more promising, except that in science, you can also have scientism, which is a belief where you're not really testing things, you're assuming. And that in itself is the same thing that they were criticizing some of the practitioners of religions for. With Christianity al alone, there are over 45,000 known denominations in the world, just to Christianity alone. And there are many other religions. Nevertheless, through recorded history in many parts of the world, there's been some more religion. And one might wonder, is it all just no primitive speculation because they weren't scientists then, they weren't educated like we were, and they didn't have computers. Or is there something to it? Aldous Huxley, credit to his genius, looked at the question differently. He said, what is it that's in common to all the major religions? What's the common denominator? There's something called signal noise detection theory, some of you might know. If you have a weak signal and you want to receive it accurately, one way of ensuring greater accuracy is to keep repeatedly sending the signal and the noise cancels out. And eventually it's clearer what the actual message, what the actual information or data is that you're seeking. So in a sense, that's what he did, looking across comparatively at religions. What's in common to all of them? What's in the essence of all of them? Ironically, if you remember when I told you about where physics is right now, soft mysticism and hard science are actually converging, ancient and modern, subjective and objective on the same conceptions of the inline structure of reality. What's coming up is what we call non-duality, not two, all connected. 
mystics refer to this as the oneness of the office. What's also coming up from all the different sources I mentioned, the revelatory experiences, the indigenous wisdom teachings, and the perennial philosophy, as there are multiple levels of reality, it's not just one level. And also, and most powerfully and important for you to know, the primacy of consciousness. Consciousness comes first. The brain, the rest of the physical world is secondary. Consciousness comes first. Now, there are also what we call non-dual practices, which allow you to shift perception of what you call reality, reduce the illusion of separation, so you can experience what we call the spaciousness of consciousness, things like mindfulness, which is part of an attitudinal presence, breath work, meditation, lucid dreaming, which is dream programming, learning to control dreams, the plant medicines, the psychedelic substances. So these are ways that ordinary people, if they wanted to experience this other level reality, indeed could. What are some of the implications of all of this? Well, coming back to these are difficult times because we're facing literally existential threats at this point. The only way out of this mess, strange enough, is in because the reality isn't really out there. That's part of our problem. We, we need to learn to not only correct our beliefs, but also overcome our fear. And thinking back again, if I could quote the Bible, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. In regards a paradigm shift, a different like a model of how you can conceptualize things, moving from ego as being our primary mindset to a broader eco, ECO mindset, ecological mindset, it leads to a new way of valuing well-being and relationships with all. It's being guided by path of the heart. It's a heart-based sense of interconnectedness, which you hear about again biblically in the golden rule, that concept, treat others as you'd have them treat you. And then scientifically, if you like, more, more recently, the work of Dr. Hans Selye, the stress pioneer, authority. And he found that one of the best ways for us to reduce our personal stress is to develop more of what he called an altruistic ego, to be more aware and considerate of the needs of others. It seems counterintuitive at first. You might think you're stressed out. How's it going to help you to take on helping someone else? But it does. You're shifting your consciousness. You're connecting closer to the source with another person. And then another aspect of this paradigm shift and understanding again that it's not all from here and a lot comes from this part, if you want to call it, the heart intelligence, is the importance of love. When R.M. Buck, the psychiatrist, wrote up his experience, the mystical experience in a book called Cosmic Consciousness many years ago, he said that he had discovered in this mystical experience that the underlying principle of the universe was love. And at the time, although I was impressed with other things in the book, that didn't make sense to me. And if anything, I must say at the time, I, I missed the, the importance of that and almost scoffed at it and thought I was just being poetic or whatever. But what did it have to do with reality and of importance? But I've come to understand it differently now. In the Bible, as you may know, it says, God is love. One of the most important Buddhist meditations is loving kindness for others. Love connects us. Hate and fear separate us. And we're living at a time right now, unfortunately, as we know, of great divisiveness. If we just think to you know what's happening in the United States of America right now, it was until recently the beacon of democracy, of opportunity for the world. And right now, there's a real possibility, if not probability, that it's failing as a democracy and as a country, as we've known, it will no longer exist beyond a very short future. And that's a real probability. And if you think about it, you know it. So you might think it can't happen. It's been around for so long, it's so powerful the people come to their senses. It's a good illustration going back to the problem of the prisoners in the cave, chained by fear. Because as you know, politically, without mentioning names or parties, there's an incredible divisiveness, almost to a violent degree, in some cases it is violent as we know, and may become more so soon, of disagreement about what the facts are. 
you have a polarization largely, as you know, of two large blocks of the population in the many of millions in both cases that literally believe the other side is totally like wrong, crazy. And even as new information comes out, they filter it. As I said, beliefs are like filters. I don't mean they do it on purpose. And there are people who know how to play with our emotions and control us. So if they stimulate fear and anger and they seem strong, you're more attracted to them. You're feeling weak, you're confused, they're strong. And people at those times are very vulnerable to bring on what we call authoritarian dictatorships. You're always seeing it happening in the world in many areas. And when you stoke in that fear and that anger, it creates also again more divisiveness. What we need is the exact opposite. We need to go back to, as Alan Saxley did, with looking at comparative religions. What's our common interests? What's our common needs? What serves us all? Again, the sense of connection. So love is what we really need, like the song, as some of you might know. You know, what the world needs now is love. Love, more love. It's the only thing we need more of. Um, in my book, I, I go into, and we do go into this perhaps in the question and answer, if you like. There are things that make it really difficult for understand and believe what I'm sharing with you today beyond I'm giving you social information and a lot of it challenges that maybe you previously have thought and been taught. There's another level that, if you like, again, filters, blocks us from being more easily aware um, and even able to believe in these things, which I can go into if you want in some detail in the Q&A. And also, I made a brief reference before to, well, if everything comes out of our imagination, everything, and if physical reality is not really out there, and we're not a result of it, it's the opposite around, we dream it up, it's part of what we populate. Again, in our dreams, we don't just have people, we also have an environment, we have objects. Then it's possible, as some of you, you know, here in a more popular way, to manifest things. But if you have a certain desire for certain things, to, again, imagine it into form, going back to physics. Much of that is not quite as simplistic as some people might want you to believe, and it's not their particular formula. But in my book, and perhaps in the Q&A, I will tell you what the steps are, because it, it, is, it is real. And it's something, when you understand it, you can experience it in your life. There are many things in my own life experience, 77 years, where it has been a part of my life. Even when I didn't totally recognize it until I could look back in retrospect, that I call it shifting reality. I can guess a better way of putting it. In physics, as I explained, our understanding is it's a probabilistic universe until again, human observation collapses the probability wave into form. So back to manifestation. What you can do when you understand the steps, which we can go into in the Q&A or it's detailed in my book, what you can do is influence favorably the probabilities for the outcome that you want to manifest. But it's not as if like you, you know, flip the light switch and just because you want it, you imagine it, it's gonna happen. So the cynics, you know, have obviously picked up on that, but they've thrown the baby out of the bathwater. It doesn't mean manifestation can't happen. It's just not that simple. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it is a significant correlation. It really makes a difference. And one that I've certainly experienced many times in my life, when you understand this, you can experience it more too. Uh, as, as one of my noted colleagues said, accidents you know, can happen, where you know there's a fluke, some, something you, you can't explain, deja vu or whatever. I've shared a lot of information with you fairly quickly, and I uh, want to give you some time to reflect and digest on it. As you know, we will have, uh, after a break, we'll have a Q&A for about an hour, if you're up to it. Um, I'm comfortable going very deep with you, if you are. Um, if I go too deep, bring me back. Um, there's there's so much here that I'd, I'd like to share with you. My book details this obviously in, in, in a lot more depth. And I might add too that it's not an ordinary book in, in a number of respects. Not only is the information phenomenally provocative of what you have previously, most people have thought of realities previously to this, but the design, it's, it's entheogenic. 
it's intellectually psychedelic. If you read it slowly, reflectively, you will experience an expansion of consciousness. It even gives you exercises so you can literally try out within minutes, like, such as the mirror exercise I gave you very briefly, and experience some of this yourself. It's not a question of whether the logic convinces you, whether you check the references, they make sense. You can actually experience it as well. The book itself is available in print. It's also available in the audio version. <laughs> Strange as it may sound, I think the ideal way of experiencing it is both. You know, if I come back to consensual reality, you're still making two different parts of the brain with the reading and the auditory. And then in terms of just consciousness, if you like, it's expansion, you're getting more information, multi-channeled information. It's, I repeat, very deep. And I really recommend people to read it slowly with reflection and to actually reread some parts of it. The same thing with the audio. You won't uh, regret that, it's work. But again, you should know the truth. And the truth is that you're free. And this is a time when we really need that clarity. We really need to have that confidence and that sense of power again. You're also welcome on my website. I've left some cards on the back table with the URL for my dedicated book webpage. You're welcome just to go to my website on that webpage. There are now a dozen or so podcast interviews where I'm being interviewed about the content of the book and expanding about it more slowly and in more maybe uh, commonsensical and lay terms. Uh, it's all free and you're, you're welcome to that. And my whole purpose is to share this information because again, I said, this world is in such crisis right now. And once you see it as, as I have, it's impossible to not care and not speak out. Uh, you know, I realized when I was writing the book and even presenting you with this uh, presentation here today, that many people would think this is so contrary to what they have believed, what they've been taught, what, what their peers would also support, that this must just be nonsense or, or, or craziness. And yet, I felt I have to speak out. I'm basing it on strong science, on comprehensive historical literature, using logic, and reflecting on three quarters of the life century experience. My colleagues around the world have greeted this book with a claim. It may change, of course, but there hasn't been one critical comment that has come across to my attention, quite the opposite. I just got a message from a psychologist I do not know, clinical psychologist in Australia just earlier this week saying, brilliant, wonderful gift to humanity. And that's the type of feedback I'm getting, even from people who I myself would have thought would have been really hard headed and very uh, opposed and even maybe want to suppress this type of thing. Um, again, we're at a really inflection point now where some of us are realizing not enough yet that we really have to re-examine our assumptions about how to get ahead in life and what's maybe owed to others as opposed to satisfying our own egos. That could be, you know, our families, our ancestors that we're going to have any, and the other people of the world. We're all affected, we're all in this together. We give ourselves the illusion again that we could just, you know, stay in our own backyard and tend to our own things. We already have experienced here in Toronto this summer, momentarily, the worst air quality index in the entire world from the forest fires up in Northern Canada. Global climate change is real. Life is not gonna go on as you've known it. And I don't mean eventually, I mean right now. The meteorologist said this last summer was the last summer where we are gonna have a smoke-free summer. That's it. It's the second eviction from the Garden of Eden of humanity. Can't go back. What we can do is greatly change the trajectory. We can become cooperative. We can collaborate. We can tend our gardens and live a very different type of life. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. We're going to take a 10 minute break.